at the fall, running away when I'd hear you call. But Father, you worked your will. I had no righteousness of my own. I had no right to draw near your throne. But Father, you love me still. And in love before you lay the world's foundation, you predestined to adopt me as your own. You have raised me up so high against my station. I'm a child of God by grace and grace alone. You left your home to seek out the lost. You knew the great and terrible cost. In Jesus, your face was set. I worked my fingers down to the bone. Nothing I did could ever atone. Jesus, you paid my debt. By your blood, I have redemption and salvation. Lord, you died that I might reap what you have sown. And you rose that I might be a new creation. I am born again by grace and grace alone. I was in darkness all of my life. I never knew the day from the night, the spirit you made me see. I swore I knew the way on my home, head full of rocks and heart made of stone. The spirit you moved in me, and at your touch my sleeping spirit was awakened. On my darkened heart the light of Christ has shone. Called into a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Heaven citizen by grace and grace alone. So I stand in faith by grace and grace alone. I will run the race by grace and grace alone. I will slay my sin by grace and grace alone. I will reach the end by grace. And grace alone. I'll let you take your seat. Uh, I've got a few things I just wanted to share. So it almost feels a little bit like a Sesame Seat, uh, Sesame Seat, Sesame Street comment. There's a few new things at the front. Uh, so first of all, I wanted to introduce Natalie. Uh, Natalie is uh, obviously leading worship today. We're so glad that she and her family are part of Cornerstone. Um, should we get your entourage to wave or hoot or holler or anything like that? So they're out the back. Hey, guys. Um, I, I, and Natalie also plays the piano. And so what I'm envisioning is, I don't know how many years, but male quartet and the, and the accompanist. So I'm thinking. So uh, get your uh, pre-orders for the CD or on uh, this week. So thank you, Natalie, for leading us. And then I want to mention um, this plant. Uh, today, uh, we're having a picnic, as you know. So uh, we are going to have enough time after the service before we assemble at the picnic. There will be some that will be going to Domino's or some will be going to, to uh, Subway. You know, you know how those things go. Uh, so we'll be meeting. Just bring your lunch. Cake will be provided. Coffee and water will be there. But the reason we thought today would be a good day to have a picnic and have some fellowship is that Pat and Edna are heading off to, Va they're going overseas, going to Vancouver Island. They're overseas missionaries from our church. So uh, get your sponsorship sign up today. Um, but honestly, this, uh, this is very meaningful to me because a few years ago, uh, Edna said, hey, do you want this, this, um, this plant? And it was a scrag. Do you remember the lilac? Oh, it's quite a lilac. Quite a, I don't know if you thought it was quite lilac that I would talk about this. But anyway, uh, that lilac has been growing beautifully in our backyard. This is only one of about six or seven um, plants that I've been able to reproduce off that lilac. I hope that there's no proprietary thing on there or copyright. Um, but what, it's, what it pictures for me today, and I hope as you, you see it at the front here, it pictures 
what we're to be about. And I think God has made Pat and Edna to be about uh, reproducing the life of Jesus and sharing the life of Jesus in their acts of service and care and baking and and uh, prayer and stuffing baskets and working at the mission thrift shop. And so I brought this because it's, it's a, a picture of how our lives, God can use our lives to reproduce blessing in the lives of others. So if you want, um, if you want one, come to my little nursery on the side of my house. I've got some more. Um, but that, that to me, I thought was a most fitting way of appreciating uh, your contribution to the ministry at Cornerstone and expecting that, you know, God's re going to repot you in Parksville. Unfortunately, not close enough to the water for my liking, but not too far. I can walk there. <laughs> I did specify waterfront property, but at any rate, we're, we're just uh, glad to know that God is moving to replant you there and you'll be a blessing there as well. I also wanted to mention two more things. Um, from time to time, and I had a very curious question this morning, why do we have a shovel at the front? But just to remind us that we're very eager for our kids to dig into God's Word. So that's why we always have the shovel at the front, and our curriculum is called Dig In, so we want our kids to get into God's Word. Uh, then just lastly, and uh, Jorge will be praying about this in a, in, a, in a little bit after some worship and that, but um, you, uh, I trust, read in the Cornerstone Connector that very, all of a sudden, an opportunity came up to uh, view and consider purchasing the United Church just down the road. It's actually 900 meters from here. Um, uh, we had a couple of failed attempts at, at viewing. Uh, a group of us got to, uh, got to view it. Uh, we had a leadership team meeting and decided to put a, a tentative offer. By tentative, I mean it's up to the congregation to make the choice. But we made an offer, a formal offer, signed offer. That was Thursday night. And then uh, Friday night, we heard from our realtor that she had been contacted by the other realtor that they actually had a pre-existing uh, accepted offer. So that was a, a discouragement to us and a great in, a discouragement to our, our uh, realtor because of some of the process. But what we're saying then is that we're not going to have the viewing uh, time this afternoon that we had anticipated. But as things unfold, we don't know any details about that other deal. And as you know, um, sometimes uh, another deal takes you out of the running and sometimes uh, other deals fall through. So we are just going to keep trusting the Lord. We're not trusting the real estate process. We're trusting the Lord in all of this. And we will, as we get any information, we'll be uh, updating you as, as best we can. So, uh, with that in mind, I want to get our attention turned uh, off of that because as we were singing, I was noticing uh, another image out the window or out the door here. I could see a squirrel across the street. And there's lots of squirrels in our lives, right? We're, we're engaged in uh, worship or we're engaged in uh, living for Jesus in some way. And then we see a oh, squirrel, right? That typical thing. And we don't want to be distracted by squirrels, be they good, be they discouraging. We want to focus on God's truth for our hearts. So listen to these, these words of aspiration. Is this what we'll say to the Lord today? I hope so. Oh, how I love your law. It's my meditation all the day. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for all of the ups and downs through which you remain absolutely faithful. And we thank you today in particular for your word. As we gather around your word today, as it tells us who you are in your love and your grace and your compassion to us, we give you thanks. We give you praise. As we gather around your word today and we hear that uh, your love is as deep and unfathomable for the youngest amongst us to the oldest, we just want to give you thanks and praise and honor you. Would you um, be the fuel of our worship to you? 
Would you be um, the focus? Uh, would you take center stage in every respect, we pray? For it's for your glory we're gathered, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> stand and let's worship our God. Darkness. 
Good morning, everyone. I hope you guys are having a good Sunday morning and enjoying your long weekend. The weather is absolutely beautiful out there, so it is just, it's just gorgeous. Um, I just have a couple of announcements for our kids today. The first is just a bit of a teaser announcement. We're going to be having a multi-sport camp in the summer for our kids. Um, so there'll be some more details coming out about that in the next little bit, but just keep your eyes open if you're interested or if you know anybody who may be interested. Um, and this week, um, our kids are going to be starting a series um, called Walk, and it's a four-point series about all the different ways we walk with God. Uh, so this week, we're going to be looking at how um, we walk with God in wisdom them and um, how we need humility and to turn to God in that. So that's what our kids are going to be focusing on. We're going to be looking at the story of Solomon and we're going to be having um, a bit of a conversation about um, how to turn to God for wisdom and the difference between um, just knowledge in our head and what wisdom is when we get it from God. Um, and I just wanted to share with you guys something that I heard today that just really blessed me. Um, I was driving to church and I heard on the radio um, they were talking about how we can create welcoming spaces for kids in our church. And so I, my ears perked up and I turned the radio up a little bit and was listening to it. And the woman goes on to talk about um, just how the people in our lives are blessings from God and how um, we should look at every person in our life, the person in front of you today, the person behind you and beside you, uh, they're not there by accident. And if you look at how many people are in the world, 
um, not just today, but uh, in the past, the present, and the future, and the different countries that are in the world. And you're sitting here today in Maple Ridge with the people around us, and how that's designed by God, and how we have an opportunity and a privilege to touch those people in our life, and just what a blessing it is for me to teach your kids um, on Sundays. <laughs> Sorry, it's just really beautiful. So I wanted to share that with you, and we'll pray for our kids. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. We thank you for this beautiful weather and this long weekend. Um, I thank you just for the blessing the people in our lives are and the privilege and responsibility you have given us just to touch them, Lord, and to share them your heart and your love. I ask that you be with our kids and just bless them today. In your name we pray. Amen. Perfect kids, you're dismissed. for you. Are we looking? Are we listening? When we look, listen, and walk slower, what do you notice? There, an invitation to be more than a bystander. Will you step out? Will you be a difference maker? At the start, making connection, connecting heaven to this earth. Let your attention become intention. Because things are not the way they should be. Not in this world, not on your street, not on mine. And that's why he called us to this. That his name, his kingdom, his will would be here as it is above. I put my shoes on to walk and pray. To pray that what seems impossible would become logical. That if I add my prayers to yours and you add yours to mine, covering our city in the same place and time, change for good is a likelihood that blessing and breakthrough can follow not just because of what we pray but because of who is listening the one who called us to this to put our shoes on together to walk and pray Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Um, why don't you look at the person behind you, beside you, and say something nice, or give them a hug or something? I know COVID is kind of over, isn't it? Come on. You all seem to be Baptists. You're too, too shy. Hi, Natalie, you're there by yourself, so hi. Anyway, um, it's good to see how enthusiastic you are. <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, I'm very excited to be here. Probably other people will be by the lake right now enjoying the boat. But this is fun. This is fun to be here, and that's what I want you to feel. It. Hey, this is our church. This is a place where we can worship, right? Well, you can worship anywhere, but it's good to be here, and I want you, I want myself to reflect that joy that it is to be in the presence of the All Almighty. Because this is good, right? I know I am very upset, I will say, for what I just heard about the, the place. Um, I've been dreaming for that, a place like that, and 
I know Pastor Brent is always a way to give me the microphone because he said, you always have to say something, right? I say, yeah, it, it, it's me. I always have to say something because it's, um, it's me. I, I, God made me that way, I guess. Uh, so I was reading my Bible this week, and I read John chapter 4. Sometimes I, well, I could mention that. And then now I hear the, the, uh, the news I just heard today, and... Say, so, yeah, it fit about what I read, because when I wanted to share that, I said it won't fit, because we are going to a place now where we can worship together, and it will be our place. So I was very excited about that, but uh, I still want to share that, because when I was reading it, it came to my mind, maybe I want to I wanna say that. So I won't take much of your time, but in John 4, 24, remember when Jesus was uh, in, in Samaria, and then he was by the well, and he met the, this woman, right? And he, he being a, 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 I hope I said it right, Jew, right? When I say in plural, it sounds like orange Jews, like the Jews, right? But I mean, today when I mean the Jews, the, the people of God, okay, don't, don't. So he, he uh, a rabbi like him, he shouldn't be talking to a woman at that time, right? But he started the conversation, and that's what she says. Why are you talking to me? Like, you shouldn't. I am a, 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 a Samari, Samaritan woman, right? And he keep on the conversation, so he confronts her very nicely, because Jesus is a gentleman. Very nicely, he said to her, yeah, you're right, you, you don't have a husband. Uh, actually, it's no, you, you're telling the truth, because that's not your husband. And I guess the way I read it, she didn't feel offended, because he was saying that to her. He just said, uh, he kept the conver she kept the conversation, and she said to him, uh, in John 4:24, our ancestors worship on this mountain. Like she didn't start arguing. Who are you to tell me I don't have a husband? Or who, like, who do you think you are? She just said, uh, our ancestors worship on this mountain. But you, the Jews, Jews, claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. And what did he say? A time is coming. Well, it won't be on the mountain, or it won't be in Jerusalem, right? It will be the time that we will worship in heart. Say, yeah, Lord, now we I think we have a place now. I said, anyway, and today I feel like, okay, there's not a place yet. And I've been in Canada 20 years. When I came to Canada, nobody told me, get a life. They told me, get a chair, because we were setting it up, right? And I've been doing this for 20 years, and... Today, all I could say is, Lord, if it's another 20 years, here I am. I will do it. I will do it because I trust in you. When Natalie was singing, I was thinking the same. You give and take away. What is my choice? Blessed be your name. And that's my invitation today to say, blessed. You are blessed, uh, and we will keep on worshiping you. If this is no... This is just a, a tiny block in our, in our walk. I'm taking too much, right, Pastor Ben? Sorry. Uh, but that, that, that's me. So that's my invitation today, to keep on worshiping him, to, to, to have the joy in our hearts. Whatever you're going through, have that joy in, our, in your heart that the All Almighty cares for you, that he loves you, that he's looking for, for you, that... He came and paid the price. And that's why we can come with confidence to the throne of grace and say, Lord, am I allowed? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. You are my son. You are my daughter. I love you. And that's what I wanted to share today. So let's pray. And uh, Edna, we're going to miss you. We are going to miss you, Pat. You too, <laughs> of course. Uh, but we will miss you guys. And... Um, but it's good. Uh, but we're very happy. We have Natalie and her husband now, and more people. You know, I love this church. I love this place. You know why? Because the Lord is here. That's why I love this place. Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, it's so good to be in your presence and to know that 
you are the all almighty and uh, you are in control this is not a problem for you if that is the place that you have for us you will give it to us and if it's not you will someday and even if I don't get to see it in my life, it's still okay because I know that you are the one taking care of us, Lord. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for the, the mercy, the love that you show to us every day. We have it so good in Canada, Father. When we hear what people go through, like right now in Ukraine and, and other places, people are starving people homeless, uh, families, broken families, and we have it so good, Lord. And we thank you for that. We thank you because you have looked to us with mercy, and you care so much about us. And I know you care about Ukraine as well. I'm I, I just, I just very grateful, Lord, that myself, I have it so good. All because of you, Lord, I don't deserve it. It's not because we deserve it, but because you have decided to bless us the way that you have. And we thank you, Lord. Today, I want to pray for those uh, who are suffering, Lord. There are marriages getting broken. There's families getting broken. There's children going under drugs and so many, so much stuff, Father, and um, thank you for, for people that put together something like the, the walk prayer. It's refreshing to see that and, and, and to believe that you can do it all, Lord. That you can, that our prayer, our prayers are heard by you and that you care and that you will act according to your will, Lord. So I pray, Father, that uh, as we take part in the, in the walk, Father, that we remember who you are. That when we pray for homes, that maybe we don't know who they are or who lives in those homes, that your grace will come to them. That your love will be displayed to them in such a way that they will need to recognize that there is a, a Lord in heaven. Thank you for this day, Father. Thank you for our pastor. And I pray, Father, that through this process he stays encouraged. Uh, because we know that our trust is in you. As he said, it is not in the realtors or not in the, in the market, in the homes market, uh, Lord, but it's in you. Our trust and our hope is in you. So we come with confidence to pray to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm going to invite the... Uh, ushers to come for the offering while they do we'll just give you that information about the walk prayer or prayer walk I believe it's called. I like that walk we all say prayer walk so walk prayer will get people's attention so that's good so uh, go to pray for ridge oh back, if we could just back up one yeah go to pray for ridge meadows dot com and it's very easy sign up you just hit participate or I, I think it's called participate you select that, and then you just choose the street where you want to walk, put your name and email address. You'll get a reminder uh, sent by email. So it's very easy to, to do, and I really encourage you to be part of that because, uh, let's be honest, there's no point in having a gathering spot if it doesn't launch us out into the community, right? So we need to be praying uh, for our community. Um, the very best thing we can do for people is to pray for them. So let's be involved in the prayer walk. As I said, very easy to sign up. And if you want to join with someone else and cover a couple more streets, if uh, it's better for you, <laughs> we were joking about what if someone signs up for Dudney Trunk Road? You could be walking for a long time. So, um, you know, maybe you'll do a chunk or uh, maybe you um, need, to, need to drive and that's fine. Uh, just to handle that how, how is best for you. Yeah, thanks for sharing your heart with us, um, Jorge. We appreciate that. And, and now I'd like to invite you to join me in God's Word. We're going to turn to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. And we'll begin, um, we'll begin at verse 1, uh, but we'll begin um, a little further along in verse 81. 
Psalm 119, verse 81. A number of years ago, when we lived up north, we uh, met a family who had the, uh, who owned a beautiful Akita dog. This is not a picture of Boaz, their dog, but uh, you'll get a, uh, an impression of the size and strength and color of their dog, Boaz. And they were a couple that loved to do wilderness hiking. Uh, they told us a story one time of being uh, two or three days hike away from their vehicle already. And Boaz, as an Akita, uh, got engaged with a, a porcupine and true to the characteristic of his breed, would not let go, would not give up, no matter how many quills he took, would not give up until that porcupine was dispatched. And uh, he had a uh, punctured lung and they had to carry him back and he made a recovery. But uh, that's always stood out in my mind as quite uh, a literal uh, example of what we refer to as dogged determination. He would not give up. He would stick with it no matter what. And in God's Word, we are invited uh, to persevere. And that's the character quality that I want to explore with you today. I've been pondering perseverance, uh, because as I've been reading through Psalm 119, as other times when I've read verses from this long chapter, I, I've been quite impressed with the um, statements of, I'm going to fulfill your word, I'm going to obey your word, I'm going to do this, and um, I, because it, it, it resonates with uh, my heart about wanting to persevere and obey God, but often finding that I fail, often finding that I come short of what uh, I had intended. So what does perseverance look like for us as followers of Jesus? As we ponder perseverance, uh, we could go to the New Testament. Uh, we could look at uh, the term which in uh, modern language it is translated uh, uh, patience, but what we discover is that perseverance uh, is translated a few different ways in the New Testament as perseverance, but also patience or endurance. And then even as we looked at a passage in our study in Revelation as patient endurance or steadfastness might be an older uh, an older word. I'm not sure if that would work so well with a younger person. Well, you just need to be more steadfast, right? And... Um, some people are bedfast, but uh, uh, you need to be more steadfast, maybe not the most common term. Well, Psalm 119, I think, gives us uh, a picture of perseverance, whereas um, in the New Testament, of course, we could maybe do a word study on it and see it in a more teaching capacity. Here we've got perseverance portrayed uh, in poetry. And I've often uh, come to appreciate the value of Hebrew poetry, because you may well know already that Hebrew poetry tends to rhyme thoughts and ideas rather than often, not always, but often English poetry is the, um, the rhyming of sounds. I was thinking also of uh, what one author said, that that's, that's a pretty good proposition because when those thoughts are translated, if it was dependent on sound, um, the sound of the Hebrew words, we'd lose a lot in the translation. But because it's dependent on thoughts and ideas, uh, we get a lot in the translation. Uh, thoughts uh, are, are here, uh, we'll see some are echoed or maybe contrasted or complemented so that the thought is more fully explored or uh, we brought other examples so we more fully understand what is being communicated. Why do the Psalms connect with us so well? I like what um, uh, Derek Kidner writes in his book on the Psalms. He says, at their face value, the Psalms are straight from life, from the battlefield, 
or from the cave. Of course, a reference to David's, King David's experience often hiding in the cave. And so I, I think the Psalms connect with us because they're expressions of real life. They're, we might say in our day, these are, these are stories straight from, um, you know, rush hour, straight from, from the workplace, straight from a, a difficult family situation. They're, they're the stuff of life. And uh, because they're beautifully done in Hebrew poetry, even uh, centuries later, in a different language, we get to connect with what God has communicated through the authors. You also may know, and in fact, you might be looking at your Bible right now and noticing that there, uh, Psalm 119 is laid out in these eight verse sections, and um, the titles of each of those sections are appropriately the different successive letters of the Hebrew alphabet, 22 sections of eight verses each. And these, um, so I, I often thought in Hebrew class it would be handy if we could have an open Bible exam because at least I'd have the alphabet there written out for me. In each of those sections uh, is used alliteration of the letter for the section. So there's great structure, there's great thought, and it, it, the, this, this passage is wonderfully crafted for us. What I also appreciate is that even though there's a great distance in terms of history and, and time period, it, but the same message is here, uh, particularly in the verses that we'll look at today, as we just looked at in our study of the um, letters to the ancient churches. Hang in there. Stay at it. Persevere. And uh, today's text obviously is just a small slice of um, Psalm 119. We're going to look at 16 of the 176 verses. Evidently, when I was a little guy and one of, I think it was my aunt, asked, what are we going to read for devotions tonight? And I, I, uh, I evidently smiled and said, let's read Psalm 119, you know, but uh, I don't think we did the whole, the whole passage. Psalm 119 really does reveal the relevance of God's Word in distressing times. Uh, Willem van Gemmeren uh, said this in his commentary, uh, this is a psalm not only of law, but of love. Not only of statute, but of spiritual strength. Not only of devotion to precept, but of loyalty to the way of the Lord. And I wonder if we might even borrow from our friend Willem this little phrase that he uses, loyalty to the way of the Lord. That's not a bad biblical definition of what perseverance is. So let's explore what these verses have to say. And I've divided it in, in two sections. Uh, first of all, uh, verses 81 through 88 and then uh, the next section will go as far as uh, verse 96. So we'll take two of these uh, strophes or, or, or structural sections of the psalm. And the first, I would say, gives us this comment, generally speaking. Perseverance requires intentional engagement with God. Uh, in this uh, section, uh, well, let me read it first, and then, then I'll make my comments. So Psalm 119, verse 81, my soul faints with longing for your salvation, but I have put my hope in your word. My eyes fail looking for your promise. I say, when will you comfort me? Though I am like a wineskin in the smoke, I do not forget your decrees. How long must your servant wait? When will you punish my persecutors? The arrogant dig pitfalls for me contrary to your law. All your commands are trustworthy. Help me, for men persecute me without cause. They almost wipe me from the, faith, from the earth, but I have not forsaken your precepts. Preserve my life according to your love, and I will obey the statutes of your mouth. Now, what we discover here is a very deliberate and intentional approach to God's Word. And to be completely honest, which I hope I'm always honest... Do you, ever, do you ever notice that? You're talking to someone and say, well, to be honest, well, what about everything else you just said to me? Was that dishonest? Um, to be open and to be vulnerable, I struggled 
and continue to struggle a bit with some of the um, expression of this psalm. Who are we, maybe I'll personalize it, who am I to say, I will obey your word? Because I don't know how many times in my, my life I said, okay, today, today I'm going to get it together. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to perfectly obey God's word. I'm, I, I'm done with all of um, falling short of what I said I would do in the past. But, but that doesn't take away from the fact uh, that this is a great pattern for us, and really I think it's clearly communicating to us that there is a call for us to intentionally engage with God. God is not inviting us to sit passively waiting for spiritual maturity to fall from the sky and bonk us on the head. God is saying, get with it spiritually. Get involved. Engage. And so we have these expressions, I have put my hope in your word. That's, that's the commitment. I want to make a comment about that. And then secondly, there is a context. And we see that in the first part of verse 81. The second part of verse 81 says, I'm going I'm to put my hope in your word. But that's usually in a context of difficulty. My soul faints. So let me just say something first about the commitment. No, notice the phrases that we've got here. And you can maybe, as I read these, just do a check uh, in your own spirit. Is this how I feel about following God, following His Word? I wait for your Word. I'm longing for your Word. I do not forget your statutes. I did not abandon your precepts, I may, uh, that I may keep the testimony of your mouth. It's very intentional, very deliberate. We're not called to patiently endure or persevere in a vacuum. The call is to press on to know Jesus. I think for me, the, the most powerful statement of that comes from Paul's testimony in Philippians chapter 3 uh, in, a, in a great passage where he says, uh, I'm going to forget about my earthly credibility I'm going to put my whole focus on knowing Jesus. He said, I want to know Christ. And then later in verse 12, not that I've already obtained it or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. So we're not talking about a once upon a time back in my youthful years, as Don and I were discussing on the Don gave me a ride to church, and we were discussing someone who was 50, and said, Don said, well, that's someone who's very young. And I said, well, it depends whether you're looking backwards or forwards, right? But this commitment is for all of our journey with Jesus. It's not just back when I was 20-something and making big decisions about life, and I decided I'm going to build my life on God's Word. And uh, it's not just for back then. It's about right now for every day that we're intentionally engaged with God. And this is not either reduced to down to some formula. If, if I can read at least 23.7 verses per day, right? It's not a formula of reading. It's about an engagement with our heart. You might get a hold of one verse or three or four verses that take you three or four days to chew on and to wrestle with and to struggle with, and you're engaged in God's Word. I would uh, strongly recommend a reading plan. I usually have a reading plan that takes a chunk at a time. So I've been working my way through Psalm 119, and that's my current chunk. Not a particular reading plan, but it's pretty, it's pretty nicely organized already for us. Eight verses a day. Um, and it takes you 20, 20, should take me 22 days, but it's taken me a lot longer. So the commitment is not just to um, a reading plan, though that's a good tool. The commitment is to be engaged intentionally. And then it comes in a context. Just, just as we're not uh, pursuing abstract ideas, we're pursuing Jesus as he's revealed in the truth of God's word, uh, we're not in a, in a vacuum when we uh, persevere. We have difficulties that we're working through. The arrogant have dug pits for me. 
People who are not in accord with your law, all your commandments are faithful, but they have persecuted me. That's verses 85 and verse 86. We're not, we're not operating uh, in isolation over the years. Some people have thought that the secret to the Christian journey is to insulate or isolate yourself from all of the negativity of society, go off and cloister yourself away in a monastery somewhere, and there you can really passionately pursue the Lord. Certainly, there are, certain, there are some distractions that are absent, but all of those get filled up with all of the internal distractions that we carry with us wherever we go. Uh, in verse 83, the psalmist uh, then identifies as a, a wineskin in the smoke. And so I was thinking about this phrase, and I thought I, I need to, uh, to wrestle with that because I don't know what that image means. And as I was investigating, I found that some commentators had concluded, well, he was describing a method used by winemakers to condition the wine or even mature the wine itself within the wineskin. Others took quite a different approach and said, no, no, that's just a description of a dried up, withered, useless wineskin. And I'm not sure if I'm prepared to land on either conclusion other than to say, we know what smoke feels like, right? We know what smoky situations are, are like. Um, we know what it's like to have uh, our province burning away and, and the smoke just filling, uh, filling the atmosphere. We know also what smoky seasons, if I could say that, smoky seasons of life are like, where we're, we're up against it and we're in difficulty, where the dreams that we've had, um, whether it's, uh, you know, collectively to, to purchase a building, whether it's um, individually, we're on some journey and we're finding uh, we're not making the progress we had hoped. Uh, we have this context of difficulty. Uh, perhaps there is outright opposition and ridicule against our walk with Jesus. And it's in those places that we are called to persevere. And I hope uh, those things that we talked about when we looked at um, Thyatira and Philadelphia and uh, Ephesus, those ancient cities that were bombarded by paganism and, and um, uh, a very highly sexualized society and other kinds of perversion, um, and worship of emperors. We don't see that as kind of, oh, that was just back then. We're in those kinds of situations today, and we need to persevere through that. So perseverance does involve our personal engagement, our intentional engagement. And then it also requires empowerment by God. And so we'll pick it up now at verse 89. Your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Your faithfulness continues through all generations. You establish the earth, and it endures. Your laws endure to this day, for all things serve you. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have preserved my life. Save me, for I'm yours. I have sought out your precepts. The wicked are waiting to destroy me, but I will ponder your statutes. To all perfection I see a limit, but your commands are boundless. So what has caused me to ponder and pause and wrestle a bit with this idea of perseverance is certainly not that we should. That, that, that's a given. That's very clear in God's Word. But for me, I've been wrestling with how, how do I do that? How do I remain faithful? What about those times where I make progress and then uh, two steps forward, three steps back, that kind of experience? What fuels real, uh, sincere perseverance in our, in our lives? Now, could we say if you're pig-headed or stubborn, you're more naturally attuned to fulfill this command? Um, and then if you're just more quiet and complacent, well, too bad for you. You won't be as, uh, have a, as much perseverance as a, uh, as a Christian. Is that, is that the case? We were talking uh, with some of the immigrant folks that I've been visiting with lately. We were talking about name meanings, and I uh, said that 
Um, evidently, my name comes from the Gaelic steep hill. I think the, the um, as far as I know, what it means is stubborn. Am I, am I better suited to persevere in my Christian journey just because I'm naturally stubborn? Um, there, you can get verification of that from someone here. It's, it's not about who we are. It's about who God is. And, that, and that's the second part of the equation. We are invited to be deliberately, intentionally engaged. But we have to be empowered by God. We have to have resources outside of ourselves. And um, there are, there's much to say about the Holy Spirit's present at work in us, engaging and helping us to persevere, but just three thoughts that I take from this section of, of Scripture. First of all, I think it would be helpful if we did some rethinking of time. Uh, this phrase stood out to me, your faithfulness continues throughout generations. Perseverance is possible because God is eternal. His faithfulness spans generations. He's not limited to the immediate. He's eternally active in our world. I'm very um, tuned into what's, what's more immediate, you know. When I'm driving, I'll use the hands-free. I think of something I need to do, so I'll send myself an email with hands-free. Uh, call so-and-so or schedule an appointment. And then all of a sudden, I see um, on, on my email, bloop, there's a new email. Oh, I want, and I've done it many times. Oh, I wonder who just emailed me. And, and then I realized it was myself. <laughs> so we're into this immediate. What's happening? not limited to our finite and really completely unrealistic time frames. And I think we really need to rethink time. What is God doing? Is God faithful when it, when it doesn't happen in the timeline that we've decided? Is God still faithful when we can't see the end to it? Um, we, we, need to, we need to rethink time and think in terms of God's time schedule. Praying for our children. Praying, uh, if someone here is praying for a spouse. If someone is uh, working through a big shift in your life from maybe one career to another. There are many, many transitions that we go through and our society entices us with this notion that you can have it now. Have it now. Oh, by the way, pay later. That's in the fine print, right? Have it now. So I think if we rethink time and if we step back and say, okay, God is faithful, as, as faithful in the future and the present as he has been in the past, and we have all of that verified for us in God's word, then I can, I can look at my time schedule differently and trust and persevere and stay, um, stay on the path that he's put me. Rethinking time. I think we should also do some rethinking of power. What really um, accomplishes or produces um, result in our lives? Well, again, it, it must be God's work. Uh, verse 92 and 93 tell us, If your law had not been my delight, then I would have perished. If I was just succumbing to the pressures around me, then I, 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 would, I would be perishing in misery. But I'm fortified by your word, even if the circumstances don't change. Uh, we were with some uh, recent immigrants from Ukraine yesterday, and, and, I, and, I, and I just, just was impressed. Uh, there was some encouragement there. And I said to Lana, we didn't do anything, really, to alleviate, you know, many challenges in their experience. But, but they were appreciating the friendship and the care and so forth. And... There are things that fortify us that go against all of these pressures. And God is at work in us, fortifying us, even when the circumstances don't change around us. Uh, in verse 93, I'll never forget your precepts, for by them you have revived me. The pressures are coming in, but because I think, no, it's not the pressure that has the power over me. It's the God who is causing me to overcome. And again, we read in Romans 8, a wonderful passage about God sustaining love for us and care so that we can be actually not just overcomers, but 
it says they're more than overcomers. Uh, a hyper, literally, you'd translate it hyper victor, uh, more than an overcomer. And then the last thing uh, on this idea of how God um, helps us persevere or He empowers us just to rethink our activity. Uh, the wicked wait for me to destroy me. I will diligently consider your testimonies. That's interesting to me. Uh, shouldn't we push back against the wicked? Shouldn't we go get them? <laughs> Let's at least cut off the ear of somebody while Jesus is being arrested. Let's at least do that much, right? But the, the, the fascinating thing to, to me is that um, our pursuit uh, that, that at the same time protects us from the pressures that are coming is getting us deeper in love with God, and, and through His Word, I will diligently consider your testimonies. Um, perseverance is not a mindless, self-sufficient activity. The answer to our stress and strain ultimately is Scripture, not in some cold mechanical way, but this is, this is where we read the revelation of who God is and how He is for us, for His glory, which is to our benefit and blessing. If you, uh, re recently I was in a prayer time and we were thinking about uh, Philippians chapter 2 and I'm just going to flip over to Philippians and you'd be disappointed if I didn't say that. And f if you're flipping over, it's chapter 2. Chapter 2 says in verse 5, just a very small little comment here, um, Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus. And backing up into verse 4, each of you should not only look to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. And um, even backing up again, verse 3, doing nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. And I, and I as we were talking about that just before we went to prayer, I, I jotted down, um, what would my schedule look like if I really took Philippians 5, uh, 2 verse 3a seriously, really seriously, do nothing out of selfish ambition. Oh, cross that appointment off. If I had to be honest, that's kind of a selfishly ambitious thing I was pursuing there. Oh, I better cross that off. Um, get rid of my dentist appointment. I have no ambition about going there. No. But you know what I mean. It, 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 it really is um, important that we scrutinize what we prioritize in our lives. It really is worth taking stock of what occupies our time, our attention, our, our financial resources. What, what, what are we doing? Where are we active? And let's, and let's be careful because sometimes when you're, you know, for me, uh, when, I'm, when I'm paddling my kayak or when i am got my hands all dirty in the soil, those are renewing, restorative times, even, even times of worship as I just enjoy um, God's presence and enjoy His creation and so forth. So we're not talking about being um, inappropriately introspective, but we need to take stock of our activity and see if we're on track with God's schedule of activity for us. We're told in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1, let's run. It doesn't say aimlessly. It doesn't say um, selfishly, certainly not. But it says run with perseverance the race that God has marked out for us. I, I always have appreciated Paul's um, benediction in Romans 15. In verse 5 and 6, we discover um, there Paul describes God as one who gives endurance and encouragement. And so as I, as I take stock of that, God is the giver of endurance. You look at Psalm 119. I'm going to endure. I'm going to stay true to your word. We really have to put those together. And, and even further, when we are engaging in a, a, a persevering lifestyle, 
were propelled into, further into God's mission. Romans 15 verse 6 says, it's so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, we're going to glorify Him as we bear fruit, as we reproduce, as we accomplish the mission that He's given to us. So in other words, I want you to get uh, Franklin Roosevelt's comments out of your mind. Uh, I believe, uh, though it's, I saw it attributed to others, I believe it was he who said, when you get to the end of your rope, tie a knot and hang on. You maybe have heard that. Maybe you've said that to your kids, you know. You know, when you get to the end of your rope, tie a knot and hang on. Uh, my sister had this as a poster. I remember it from childhood. But that's, that's not perseverance. It's not tying a knot and just hanging on. And then that kind of begs the question, hang on how long till what, when? Who's going to help me off this rope? Is somebody going to come along and cut me down at some point? No, um, perseverance is extremely purposeful. It's not just treading water. It is entering further and more fully into God's mission. So if you want to check out some of these notes, uh, of course, as usual, go to Digging Deeper on our website um, on the sermon page, and then there will be the, the PDF document. You can open that up and, and explore a little further. I guess in conclusion, I want to ask you the question, is God calling us to be like Boaz, the dog? Is he saying, you've got to persevere, you've got to keep at it? And I, the picture in my mind is as, as, as uh, majestic and as powerful as Boaz, the Akita, uh, is. I, I, I imagine he's still living. I'm not sure. Um, I think he could have backed off that porcupine that maybe wasn't the most purposeful perseverance. No, I think God has this delightful tension for us of diligence and dependence. Diligence on our part, and then complete and utter dependence upon Him. And it sounds contradictory. Someone might say, well, which is it? Are you fully depending on God, or are you being diligent and engaging? And the answer is, yes. Both. God is designed for it to work together. I think that's really wonderful. I think that's really mysteriously and wonderfully gracious of God to say, I'm going to fuel you, but I'm not just going to do it for you. You've got to engage. You've got to engage in that. And I think uh, parents understand, you know, what it's like. It's so delightful to empower your children, but to see them take responsibility and to engage but let's just avoid, be careful about um, different uh, extremes. One extreme, I'll call it stoicism, or to be a stoic. I think this would be a misunderstanding of diligence and thinking that it all depends upon me. It's all on my shoulders. I've got to work for God. And Hilary of Tours, um, says Eugene Peterson many, many centuries ago, called this irreligiosa solicitudo pro deo. I don't know if you suffer from that malady. It means in Latin, a blasphemous anxiety to do God's work for him. Do we ever suffer from that? I'll do it for you, Lord. I'll figure it out. I'll, I, I'll do it, right? That, we're not called to that. That would be the dangerous extreme of being so stoic and it's all on my shoulders. I've got to do it for God. Yes, we should be engaged, but not to that an inappropriate extreme. Another extreme, I'll just call it fatalism. Uh, the, the, the fatalist says, oh well, whatever happens, happens. If I die, I die. If I live, I live. It's just kind of a fatalistic approach. There are religious um, thoughts out there today where their idea of God is that He's so other, so disengaged from human existence that it's very almost capricious on his part whether you will, you will survive or not. But when we have faith in Jesus Christ, we have a relationship with a God who is active and alive. We might, might not see every detail. We might not see it uh, in the time frame that we had imagined, but he's alive. And so we need not to worry, but to trust and so we don't want to go to that extreme. I love what Corey Ten Boom said. Worry does not empty, empty tomorrow of its sorrow, 
it empties today of its strength. There is no separation between God's commands and his care. They, they nurture and sustain us as we diligently depend upon him. We're told in Hebrews chapter 10 that we need to persevere so that when we have done the will of God, we will receive what he has promised. Wherever we look in the scripture, we're called uh, to persevere in our relationship with Jesus. We saw it in our study of the ancient churches. We see it in uh, portrayed for us here in Psalm 119. And I really think it's a grace gift from God that perseverance is at the same time all of God and it fully engages us in his kingdom work. And let's remember that there are incredible possibilities to perseverance. Verse 96 concludes, your commands are boundless. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that what you are capable of doing is beyond our imagination. Uh, and so thank you that um, you haven't invited us into some boring, passive, um, fatalistic existence, that you've invited us to be passionately and deeply engaged in your work and at the same time totally free and filled with joy because it's all um, based on your power and your performance. Help us to remember that. Help us to live that way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
join me in uh, a benediction and I'll uh, read the bold print and then I'll let you uh, respond with the uh, shared affirmation. Jesus said, I am the way. Together, we will trust. Okay, I will, I will coach you along. Sorry about that. Jesus said, I am the way. We will trust in him to lead us in his mission. Jesus said, I am the truth. We will believe what his word says to our hearts. Jesus said, I am the life. We will find in him all that we need to live. Jesus said, do not be afraid. Peace be with you. We will trust and not be afraid. Now, may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. And together, to him be glory forever and ever. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Well, bless you today. Um, do take some time to get your lunch together. Maybe in the next half hour, we'll, we'll convene at the park uh, just over here. And um, just a couple of uh, reminders. Picnic first here today. Next Saturday, men's breakfast, 8 o'clock. Women's exo night, seven o'clock, uh, uh, 8 o'clock in the morning for breakfast, 7 p.m., for Women's Exo Night, and uh, both of those events are at the Wildwood Church. Next Sunday is the AGM, so please make sure you've got your booklet. Um, if you didn't get a booklet there at the ushers table, one of the ushers will make sure you get a copy, and uh, we'll just uh, and there won't there will not be um, a viewing of the church today. Just to make sure we're all clear on that, um, I think we've covered everything. So the Lord bless you and give you a great week.